Okay. Uh, so um, I was thinking yesterday what what to say today. So I'm going to speak about harmonic functions, Dirichlet problem, harmonic measure, and the unfortunate thing that I can really uh, talk too much about it, so that the whole length of the course. So probably I will just uh, briefly go through some things. Uh, uh, so um, why harmonic functions are important? Uh, they are, uh, well, one of the reasons they are important is because of the so-called Dirichlet problem. Uh, and uh, so suppose that you want to calculate temperature in this room if you know temperature on the walls. So uh, once, if it's stationary, if it's stationary, then it will be a harmonic function of a point. Because basically temperature at every point will be the mean value of temperatures uh, around it. Otherwise, if it's more than it will heat up, if it's less than it will cool down. So the temperature, uh, stationary temperature is a harmonic function. There is also a heat equation which which says that, uh, well, the derivative in T of the temperature is equal to the Laplacian of the temperature, but that, that we're not uh, discussing today. But if it's stationary, you need to solve the following problem. So we have domain omega, mm, domain omega uh, phi, uh, a function on the boundary. So usually, for simplicity, when, when Dirichlet introduced it or, or Green was solving it, then, of course, they uh, simplified it that it's uh, to some sort of nice boundary uh, and nice, nice function phi. So for example, it's significantly easier to solve it if uh, boundary is a smooth curve and if phi is a, uh, is a smooth function. but. Uh, uh, by like mid 20th century, people understood that there is no no difference, at least not in dimension two. Uh, so the Dirichlet problem is uh, uh, find h, uh, which is harmonic inside omega, such that h on the boundary of omega is equal to phi. So for the second one, you probably need to ask so something like uh, that h is harmonic in omega and also let's say, continuous in the closure of the omega. So if, or, 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 or something like that. So for example, that, that works if phi, if phi is continuous. But you can imagine all sorts of things. So you can imagine, for example, a domain where you put phi equal 1 on this arc and phi equals 0 on this arc and then it's discontinuous here here and obviously the solution also will be discontinuous at these two points so for example for this one one can show that the uh, the solution h will be continuous and here it will tend to 1 here it will tend to 0 but if you approach to this point then there will be sort of a funny jump discontinuity so it's uh, this should be understood appropriately so I'm just saying that there are, there are, there are a couple of complications. If, if phi is not continuous, how, how do you understand this? Usually then understand that for almost all points on the boundary, h tends to phi if you go on tangentially or something like that. Or you can understand in the terms of functionals, like uh, for any uh, function against which you integrate, you get the same integrals. So, uh, so this is uh, of big physical importance uh, because, for example, if, if you have a stationary uh, temperature, stationary distribution of heat, uh, then it's harmonic inside. So knowing it on the boundary can calculate it inside. But also we'll have some other physical examples when uh, such functions pop up. Uh, so uh, the question how, how uh, to, I'm not, uh, Okay, I'm not going to give a proof that it's solvable because uh, if I to give a proof, I have to address this sort of things. But I instead of mention how you can give three or four different proofs uh, depending on what, what courses you have followed before. So um, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, well, yeah, different proofs or other approaches. Uh, so the first one is uh, to uh, consider, uh, let's say it's a variation of approach, consider 
all functions, uh, well, whatever, phi capital, phi capital, which are uh, continuous uh, inside omega and uh, continuous up to the boundary, uh, smooth inside omega and continuous up to the boundary. And such that this, uh, uh, and uh, define the Dirichlet energy, so I of phi is defined as a area integral of gradient of phi squared over omega. And then uh, uh, H, the function H in question, minimizes, minimizes I of phi over all phi such that uh, uh, on the boundary of omega it's equal to the boundary values. So the solution of this problem can be obtained variationally. You take all the functions with these boundary values and then, then you uh, minimize this area integral. So if you have seen Sobolev spaces, who has seen Sobolev spaces? Yeah, so it's, it's basically, this integral is what, what is called, uh, well, up to, so this is, uh, this is a norm in the space W12. So in the space of our functions which are integrable with a, with a square, uh, with a, whose derivative is integrable with a square. So this is very nice space and um, Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe I just want to make one remark because we'll see it later in the I had one more exercise. So the exercise is that though it's a nice space, uh, it does not uh, uh, functions there are not necessarily continuous. So uh, the exercise is that uh, uh, I of phi finite doesn't imply that phi continues. Unfortunately, just a little bit, uh, uh, you can have one point discontinuity. And the hint, hint is that uh, uh, look, uh, look at functions which, which are just function of, of the radius. Look at, uh, at functions which are, um, well, for example, logarithms or things, or thing, or things like that, at, uh, at functions like log x squared plus y squared, for example, to some power alpha. Uh, so there are. So uh, so uh, uh, so this is uh, just a small off-topic thing because we'll see it a bit later. It's a, a very important space. Unfortunately, if if you it doesn't uh, mean that the functions are continuous. So if you ask two plus epsilon, then you automatically get continuity, Hölder continuity even, uh, but. Uh, uh, and, uh, but a priori it does not, uh, da does, doesn't mean that the function is continuous, so it's, it's uh, uh, working, for example, with this thing. Of course, solution is always continuous, but uh, inside domain, but, but there are, there are, there are some, some sort of difficulty. Now, if, if one follows this approach, then essentially you have to do two steps. First, you, you, you take some function, you prove first that there is a minimizer. So you need to prove some compactness, sort of, to say we'll see it later today in discrete setting. And then you take the minimizer and you show that if it's not harmonic, you can a little bit perturb it so that the thing, so that the thing becomes smaller. So it's, it's uh, 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 well, maybe a small remark, a remark on this. Uh, uh, so suppose, uh, uh, do, let's do variation, variation. So we take, uh, instead of phi, we take phi plus epsilon, what is another good letter? Epsilon psi. Then, uh, and psi, psi is, for example, psi is uh, with compact, uh, nice, uh, smooth with compact support, so it's just some function like that. Then I of phi plus epsilon psi, well, it's this area integral gradient of phi plus epsilon gradient of psi 
squared. And if you open up the brackets, you get the, grade, the integral of gradient of phi, so it's i of phi. And then the next term will be epsilon, so it will be epsilon uh, array integral of the scalar product of gradient phi and gradient psi. And then there will be epsilon square, uh, which is much smaller, so you can forget about it. So this is the variation. And uh, if you, you have an optimizer, if you have an optimizer, you see my variation, it will be uh, no matter what is the sign of this integral, it will be for positive and negative epsilon, you get different values, either positive or negative. So if you have optimizer, this integral should be zero, because otherwise you can decrease it either by taking very small positive epsilon or very, uh, so this is negligible, very large. So, so if, uh, if phi is optimizer, if optimizes, then uh, you get that for every psi, every integral, this every integral gradient of psi is equal to zero. But this integral you can take by parts. So you can take by parts, and I was careful enough to ask that psi has compact support. So if you take by parts, that will be minus every integral of uh, Laplacian of phi times psi. So for every psi, such integral is zero. So it means that Laplacian of phi is identically zero. Oops, the other way around. So, uh, so this part is easy. So the difficult part is to prove that there is an optimizer. You need some sort of compactness. And then the difficult part is to deduce boundary conditions because, as I said, uh, this Sobolev space, uh, it's a little bit less than you need for continuity. So you cannot, uh, you cannot show that the difference at two nearby points is small. You can show that, for example, different of averages near two arcs nearby is small, things like that. So we need to, to work a little bit carefully. So that's, that's the first approach, and I just mainly it's, uh, I wrote it because I want to write wanted to write Dirichlet energy because we will see it later. Now uh, the second approach. Uh, now who knows what Brownian motion is? <laughs> okay, so the second approach is uh, uh, very <laughs> very easy. You you start Brownian motion. So I, I want to mention it now. We'll discuss these things later. If you start Brownian motion at a point inside the domain, eventually it will hit the boundary of domain, almost surely. So here there is a, if, if you have simply connected domain, that's always true. It's not always true if you have, for example, domain which is outside of a counter set. If counter set is too small, you will never hit it. So for example, if you have a domain which is outside of four, five points, Brownian motion never hits five points, or one point, or ten points. So, so this works for simply connected domain. Well, uh, this actually shows that harmonic Measuring Dirichlet problem, it works only not for every domain, but for all simply connected. Uh, so what you do, Brownian motion eventually hits. Uh, so start Brownian motion. Uh, Brownian motion, uh, let's say B Z T. Uh, started at started at Z. Now, co tau to be the uh, first time. It hits boundary of omega. So this first time where it hits boundary of omega. And now you do the following thing. You set function h of z is the expected value of uh, phi at the point where Brownian motion will hit the boundary. So for every point z, you can start Brownian motion. Eventually, it will hit the boundary, maybe here, maybe here, and you just average over all phi over all possible hitting places. So this is sort of exit measure. So it turns out uh, that uh, first this function is harmonic. Then if you change the point where you start, it behaves harmonically. And also, if you are very close to the boundary, then almost surely you hit, uh, with big probability, you hit near this point. So we get continuity at the boundary. So in a sense, this is uh, the easiest proof 
if you know probability. If you already have all the terminology from probability textbook, then that's the easiest proof. We'll discuss, discuss it later uh, a little bit. So this is due, due to a Japanese mathematician Shizuo Kakutani. So if you took functional analysis course, you maybe also had his fixed point theorem. So he said that he tried to make a career in functional analysis in the 30s, but Polish and American and French mathematicians were proving much better theorems, so he switched to probability where, uh, where he excelled. But well, his fixed point theorem also is, is quite good. So that's, uh, that was his observation that Brownian motion is related to harmonic function, so it's I think 1942. Uh, now, uh, mm, the, third, the third point is uh, sort of uh, an abstract, it's kind of a functional analysis approach. So you have, uh, you have this, uh, uh, you will have a linear operator or linear, linear, opera, uh, linear functional which uh, given boundary values phi gives you h at point z0. Or if you want linear operate, so it's a linear functional from functions, say continuous functions on the boundary of omega to real numbers. Or a linear operator uh, from uh, phi to function h, so it's from continuous function on boundary omega to the harmonic functions in the domain omega. So this is if you already constructed it. You can clearly show that it's a linear function. So if I take uh, boundary values phi 1, boundary values phi 2, uh, and you, I add them, then uh, I, I should also add h. So it be linearly behaves in it. So now it's a linear functional on continuous functions. A linear function on continuous functions is given by some measure. So since it's linear function on continuous functions, then it means that it's given, given by a measure. Uh, let's call it, uh, call it omega with uh, index z because, or index z0. So it's, it's called a harmonic measure. Measure uh, on boundary of omega viewed from z0. So it's basically h of z0 is equal to integral of phi of u d omega z0 of u. So this definition of harmonic measure, so one can also observe that uh, the function z. Uh, uh, well, goes to omega of z is harmonic as a function uh, from omega to the space of measures. Uh, I don't know how do we denote space of measures m. Well, whatever measures on the omega. Uh, so, uh, so this, this previous uh, method, Brown in motion, means that harmonic measure is exactly the exit measure for Brown in motion. It measures how likely Brown in motion is to exit through a given piece of boundary. So by, uh, by, by, uh, by part two, omega z zero of some uh, whatever set E is the probability that. Uh, B uh, started at z0, exits, B started at z0, exits uh, through the set E. Which immediately tells us uh, something, uh, some in, gives us some intuition. So, for example, if z0 is close to E, then harmonic measure is very large because you are likely to exit here. If z0 is far from E, then harmonic measure of E is small. Also, uh, one can write, I don't want to write exact estimates now, but by Harnack inequality, 
You can write things like uh, omega z0 of E is comparable to omega z1 of E if z0 and z1 are close. So it's So this is uh, a very important measure, so I will give another definition in a second. Uh, so I uh, want to sort of uh, show that, uh, well, maybe, okay, each lecture should contain a famous open problem. <laughs> uh, so, um, so obviously it's, it's quite clear that the support of measure omega is equal to the boundary uh, oops, of the measure omega. Uh, yeah, because they are comparable, usually people forget what is the reference point. Because for properties of omega, it's not usually not very enough for interesting properties. So support of omega is the whole boundary of our, our set. Uh, so if you have a domain, its boundary can have any dimension. It can be von Koch snowflake. Uh, it, it can have, uh, so dimension of boundary of omega can be two even. So uh, uh, the uh, dimension of the omega can be two, even positive area. But uh, there is a theorem by, uh, uh, so there is a theorem by uh, Nick Makarov. So it's fairly recent, uh, so it's, which uh, is a rare example of theorem in mathematical physics, which was unexpected by physicists. So physicists were shocked when it was proved that uh, uh, Hausdorff dimension of the measure itself is always equal to 1. What does it mean? That uh, uh, there is a Borel uh, subset, uh, let's say, E inside the omega. So of course the set will be dense, uh, such that uh, uh, Hausdorff dimension of E is equal to 1 and omega of E uh, of the complement of E is 0. So, um, so omega lives on. So uh, what uh, this theorem sort of means is that if I take a big fractal domain, it can have boundary of positive area or anything. But when I start brown and motion, what I, I can enter arbitrary fjord, I can go all the way down. But you can always select some points which are sort of tips of uh, peninsula so that the total Hausdorff dimension is one and you only hit at these points. But it's a dense set so it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, compact support can have high dimension but, uh, but uh, the support is, is there. So harmonic, uh, so what, why, why I mentioned this, it's, it's kind of a Mm, plays role in some of the physical phenomena we are going to discuss that if, if you hit the boundary with growing in motion, boundary can be very fractal but still you hit it at flat places, at flat exposed places. But some of these flat places can be at the bottom of the fjords. So this is, uh, this is a, a very shocking theorem. It's actually uh, quite, uh, quite interesting that uh, he even wrote a correct gauge function for this thing and the gauge the correct, uh, the correct gauge function for, for omega, the maximum one, it looks like c square root of log, 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 well, r square root log, 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 one over r. So there is, there is also uh, r square root of log r, one over r, log, log, log. So there is even interesting correct gauge function. It's not as surprising if you took a probability course, because in probability course there is a part about uh, sort of large deviation where there is a log log thing. So it's this log log about large deviations only um, mm, the second log is because the parameter and probability is actually log of 1 over r. So it's, it's, it's not, uh, not unexpected if you, if, you, if you know some probability. Okay, so the, what is the wide open question? So wide open. Uh, what is the Hausdorff dimension of omega uh, of omega uh, in R3. No one knows. So when Makarov proved his theorem, first people thought that uh, 
maybe it's also dimension two. But there are famous, uh, there are famous results by, uh, so there are results by a couple of famous people. Uh, so uh, Jean Bourguin, uh, who unfortunately died this year, who was one of the Belgian analysts, one of the best, he proved that it's, max, it's smaller than three minus epsilon. And then uh, Tom Wolf, an American analyst, well, who died in a car crash, well, I don't know why people had said stories here. So it's, uh, so this, this maximum of all domains is not three, not two. So it's something in between. And Mandelbrot has a conjecture that it's two and a half, but there is no, no particular, particular reason. Well, there is a particular reason, but it's, so this is, this is, uh, uh, this is sort of a, uh, an open question. It's not the subject of this course, but it actually uh, relates to some growth processes we study in physics. And Benoit Mandelbrot actually says uh, his conjectures that the harmonic, that if you take our lungs, which is a fractal set, then their harmonic measure has dimension two and a half. Harmonic dimension on the lungs is important because we use la uh, lungs to transfer oxygen from air to blood. So you need uh, a set of blood vessels and the set of uh, vessels where oxygen is to have maximum possible contact. And oxygen goes by, by, by Brownian motion, so it's more or less you want really to have maximum possible contact. So we have these two fractal sets and, well, the conjecture is that it's two and a half, but uh, it's, it's kind of sort of some not very reliable numerics. Okay, that's uh, one more. And then now, uh, uh, one more is, uh, one more approach is uh, uh, a physics approach. Uh, and again, so this, this uh, I need to mention without a proof. Uh, so it turns out that the uh, one, two, three, four, that omega is the electrostatic equilibrium measure. So what does that mean? It means that uh, suppose I take, I make boundary of my domain out of iron and I put, uh, so uh, uh, let's say, conducting boundary of omega and put, uh, let's say, plus one charge on it. So it will distribute, it will start distributing in some most efficient way. Now, how does the point Z0 act in? Well, Z0 acts, you put at Z0, you put and uh, minus one at Z0. So I put minus one charge here. One option is to study harmonic measure not inside domain, but outside. Yeah, by the way, uh, so I, uh, we, uh, uh, I so far was saying that we take a domain which is inside of a curve. I was drawing all the pictures. But we can also look at the domains uh, which are outside of a curve and include infinity. And for some of our growth processes, it will be better to include such domains. And if you have a domain which is outside of a curve, there is a distinguished point infinity. So in that case, usually people write harmonic measure viewed from infinity. So you do minus one charge at infinity, or you do, you start drawing in motion at infinity, or things like that. So, uh, what does uh, physics teach us? Uh, well, physics teaches us that uh, if, if you put charge here, it will try to distribute itself in the most efficient way. Now, uh, if I put, uh, well, let's say one half of plus charges here, one half here, they will start repelling each other. And they will repel with the force, which is uh, in 3D, it's uh, one over distance. In 2D, it's logarithm of, so it's two-dimensional electrostatics, so it's, it's uh, as if we live in a flatland. Uh, so, uh, so the charges repel with a force which is logarithm of R. So it's basically omega, uh, let's say, if I say omega from infinity, then it, uh, it minimizes the energy uh, which, uh, among all measures, which is the uh, uh, double integral of uh, what, uh, logarithm 1 over uh, u minus v, d mu of u, d mu of v. 
So this is if I just put plus charges here. Uh, so we boundary omega, boundary of omega. Uh, if, if, if I uh, take omega z0, I should also take into account that all these charges, they are attracted to minus 1. So it will be omega z0 will minimize, uh, uh, well, the same integral. And then minus uh, the integral logarithm of 1 over u minus z0, d mu of u. Well, it's, it's an energy, so it's also denoted by letter I, but it's, it's not the same energy. Uh, and, uh, well, it, it's, it's a function of a different object. Uh, let's say maybe I denote it by letter E, uh, E of mu. But usually people, people define it as uh, denoted by I. So uh, the remark is that uh, if we do it in 3D, uh, then you should uh, put 1 over absolute value of u minus v. So there the electrostatic potential is such. And this is, this is actually the problem why, uh, why this 2 and a half is wide open in 3D. Uh, because in 2D, if you look uh, at Makarov's proof, he uses that logarithm is an analytic function. So logarithm uh, z features prominently this analytic function. And in 3D, you don't have analytic functions. And moreover, 1 over u is not a harmonic function either. So it's, uh, well, it is harmonic function, but uh, you need to work with some, uh, some functions of it which are no longer harmonic, so that, that causes some problem. Yeah, so it's gradient. Is not, uh, you need to work with the absolute value of the gradient, so it's, it's not harmonic. Okay, now uh, what uh, physics studies, so the value of this e, e of omega is called the capacity, so that's what is, uh, well, uh, E of omega, which is infimum over mu, E of mu, is called uh, Robin's constant, so it's Robin's constant. And then uh, you call, I always sort of mess it up, uh, Wiener, Norbert Wiener capacity. Wiener capacity is its uh, uh, gamma E is 1 over Robin's constant. And uh, the usual capacity uh, we study, or log capacity, is um, exponential minus gamma E. It's exactly the same, the same word as capacity. If you have a condensator, then capacity of condensator, uh, it's, it's exactly this one. Uh, and in that way, it, this physical notion, it uh, migrated into analysis and mathematical physics. So uh, for what, whatever, whatever potential I can write, I can define capacities. So this capacity is for logarithmic potential, but I can define it for other potentials like 1 over r, 1 over r to some power alpha. Uh, so I, I was saying that we most, I think maybe we always will work with connected sets. So connected set always has a positive capacity. But if I draw a counter set and I study these problems there, there are counter sets which are never hit by Brown and motion. For example, counter set of dimension 0 will never be hit by Brown and motion. And it will have zero capacity. So it's not, uh, not sort of enough to put a charge on in a reasonable sort of way. You can put charge at a point, but the potential will blow up near the point. So near this point, potential blows up. But, uh, so sets have positive capacity if you can distribute charge on them in such a way that the potential will be finite near the set. So that's, that's the definition. So. Uh, it's not pertinent for this course, but normally if you do harmonic measure and capacities, uh, if the set is disconnected, there is a condition that it, it has to be fat enough. Basically not bigger than dimension zero in, in sort of a way. Uh, well, not exactly. It's, it's, there is no if and only if condition with dimensions, but having, you can think big enough dimension. Okay, and now the last, last approach. Uh, 
so I kind of feel bad that I don't give proofs. Well, no, I gave some proof, sort of. Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, yeah, my yesterday's calculation was that to give this the proofs, I need five lectures, and then uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the other one is that uh, uh, there is approach by conformal invariance. And suppose that I have one domain omega and I have another domain omega. And I have a conformal map F. So if I have function phi here, uh, I can write here function phi of f of z on the boundary. Let's say phi of u. So if here h is harmonic, h is equal to phi on the boundary of omega 2, then I can move h back. I can just write h composed with f, h of f. It will be harmonic in the domain omega 1. And h composed with f will be uh, equal to phi composed with f on the boundary of omega 1. So if I know how to solve Dirichlet problem in one domain, I can map the solution to another because harmonic, uh, because uh, harmonic functions are mapped by harmonic functions. So I used here that if, uh, uh, so I, we use the following fact that uh, if f is uh, analytic uh, and h is harmonic, then uh, h of f is harmonic. Okay, the, uh, again, I, I, I sort of there is a thing about the bar and direct correspondence which I completely well, refuse to discuss because uh, if the domain is smooth, conformal map can be extended to the boundary of the domain. If the domain is non smooth, uh, well, for example, the boundary, or even worse, boundary is not a Jordan curve, then uh, these things that h is equal to phi on the boundary should be understood in a more complicated way, but it's, it's, a, it's a whole science and uh, it's kind of like, well, three or four lectures to discuss in which way you understand it. But, uh, but let's say for now the domains are Jordan curves. Now, uh, because of that, you can map to your favorite domain. Now, different people have different favorite domains, but in, in this case, uh, I would say that the best one probably is the disk. So we can map, map to a disk, to the disk, to the unit disk. Uh, and now, uh, so we have our domain, we map it to the unit disk. So on the, we, we took our function here, we mapped it here. There is function phi on the boundary. And uh, in the unit disk, it's fairly clear what is the value of our function at the center. Because harmonic functions have mean value property. So at the center, the value of the function will be just uh, integral on the boundary. It's also true by symmetry. So in the unit disk, in the unit disk, uh, h of 0 is just the mean value integral from 0 to 2 pi uh, of uh, phi of e to the power i theta d theta divided by 2 pi. Now you can ask a question. Uh, Suppose we want in a unit disk to calculate the value not at 0, but at some other point of our function h. Any suggestions how to do it in one step? You no longer can use symmetry, it seems, but can we reduce it to this problem? Yes, how? Yes, use conformal map. We can map this conformally. So the map which maps uh, point A to point 0 uh, is just uh, z minus A 
over 1 minus a bar z. And then uh, you get a formula for h of a, which, which will be some integral of phi times something, depending on a. So let's, let's do this as an exercise. So this uh, uh, find something. Not any something, but this particular something from this formula. So it will be just the derivative of, derivative of this map, derivative of this map on the boundary. So in the unit disk, uh, you can find exactly this thing. And this thing is called, uh, this something is called Poisson kernel. So it's called uh, Poisson kernel. So the function which tells you which, which gives you the solution of the Dirichlet problem, or which gives you a harmonic measure in a disk, is called Poisson kernel. There is an exact formula. For a half plane also, it's easy to write an exact formula. Okay. Yeah, so let's, let's do it as, a, as an exercise. And the last thing which I want briefly mention before, before I pass to the, to the discrete setting. Uh, is the so-called Green function, Green's function. Do you call it Green function or Green's function? Green's. Green's. So, so, so traditionally, like in English, you for great theorems, you don't add apostrophe S, like Pythagoras theorem uh, or well, whatever, Euler theorem. You, it's not Euler theorem because it's great. And Green's function is great enough, but uh, his family name is Green, and then people would think that it's a green covered function. So it's uh, Green's function. So uh, he was perhaps the first who really did a rigorous solution of the Dirichlet problem. Mm. And uh, basically, uh, well, there are, well, so it's, it's another approach. Say, so let's say approach number six. Uh, mm. So basically, well, Roughly speaking, uh, Green's function of uh, two points, uh, let's say uh, u and v, uh, is, uh, has the following property that Laplacian of this Green's function, Laplacian in u, is delta measured u minus v. So it's basically uh, 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 you, it's a function from omega, so g is a function from omega times omega into real numbers. Such that uh, it's generally harmonic in u and in v. And not, but on diagonal, you get delta measure as a, as a Laplacian. So, uh, and also the other property is that g of v is equal to zero if v belongs to the boundary. So that's, that's, that's sort of a rough um, mm, definition. The uh, more rigorous, the, the way usually people define it is that uh, uh, g of uh, z, z zero uh, is uh, minimal, is the minimal function uh, function in omega uh, such that it's uh, g is at least zero, g is harmonic uh, apart from the point z zero. And uh, g uh, near z zero, uh, uh, well, let's say z zero plus, uh, well, g at z is equal to logarithm of 1 z minus over z0 uh, plus uh, 
uh, capital of one when uh, z is near z zero. So basically, if you fix, if if we have our domain omega and I fix point z zero, then the function will be zero on the boundary and near z zero it will have a logarithmic singularity. And maybe the remark which, which I made already yesterday is that the, if I take the Laplacian of the function logarithm 1 over z minus z0, then this function, it's very easy to check that it's everywhere harmonic but z0. But uh, it's exactly, the Laplacian is exactly delta mirrored z0. It's the same thing as with d bar of 1, of 1 over z. The d bar of 1 over z will be. Is there a constant in front, 1 over 2 pi or something? I think. I always, I always, yeah. It also depends what, what is your Laplacian, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, maybe with the coin. There, there, there is the so-called Littlewood convention in analysis that all the identities I write are up to multiplicative, up to multiplication by 2 or pi or e or any combination thereof. So it's, uh, so it's, there might be 2 pi. Uh, well, exercise. Well, it depends on the definition of Laplacian. With my Laplacian, I think it's 2 pi. Yes? 2 pi? I think so. Sorry? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I don't have pi in definition of Laplacian. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's. Okay, let's say exercise. Well, it's, it's uh, easier sort of to see that uh, the bar of 1 over z minus z0 is the delta measure at z0. And this is easier to calculate with the Cauchy formula. And Cauchy formula has 1 over 2 pi. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's 2 pi. I think it's 2 pi. Well, OK. I have it somewhere in my notes. OK. So the uh, greens. Uh, uh, yeah, and usually people, so some people also divide, divide, de, de, define it uh, outside the domain, then they, they add one more property that it's subharmonic everywhere. And also it's just uh, sometimes people add that it's, it's subharmonic uh, in the whole plane minus the zero. Okay. Now, uh, So I just write maybe a couple of uh, properties of the function. So a few remarks about this function, and then we'll go to the break. That in the unit disk, it's uh, uh, g of uh, z and 0. It's just logarithm of 1 over absolute value of z. Uh, g of uh, z1 and z2. You can do conformal map and you can, cal can calculate. Again, maybe it's better to do it in the exercises, but it will be an exact formula. Uh, so maybe another exercise, z1 minus z2 over 1 minus z1, z2 bar. So the second remark is that g is the potential uh, for that problem, that physics problem we discussed for uh, a plus one charge at uh, z0 minus one charge on the boundary. So uh, potential should be identically the same on the boundary because I said that boundary is conducting so we are free to move around it. Uh, now I set it to be equal to zero there, and then, well, that will be the potential. Okay, of course, the third one is that G is conformally invariant. I, 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 yeah, I didn't also say that it's symmetric, but it's sort of clear from the one of the definition G of uv is equal to g of vu. 
OK, that we don't need. And now uh, maybe, maybe an interesting remark, which is uh, sort of explains why uh, we kind of interested in. So, so suppose I have a unit disk, and suppose I have an arc i of length, length of i is equal to, let's say, delta. And then harmonic measure of i is also equal to delta. Well, delta over 2 pi is the same thing. Now, there is this point which is directly above i. So it's, for example, the point which you can do, uh, you can do half circle and you can put this point zi uh, above it. So what, what will happen if I take this formula for g of z is that uh, g of zi will be a logarithm of 1 over, so what's the distance? So here I have, a, a, so this distance is approximately delta. And the length of this interval is approximately delta, or exactly delta. So it's approximately logarithm of uh, z, which is 1 minus delta, so 1 minus delta, which is approximately, uh, so logarithm of 1 minus delta is delta. Well, it's approximately uh, logarithm 1 plus delta, which is approximately delta. And also, if I do gradient of g of zi, it will be approximately gradient of logarithm of 1. Well, you, you just get, get, get the same thing. Uh, so it's uh, uh, yeah, also will be approximately delta. Am I correct? Uh, gradient of G is approximately, no, is approximately 1. Yeah, no, maybe that's that we don't need. It. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so basically, this, this is the thing which uh, we'll use later in the estimates that uh, harmonic measure of I is approximately G of the point which resides directly above I. And by conformal invariance, that will be sort of true in any domain. So if I take some arc here and I take point directly above, then uh, Green's function will be like harmonic measure. Or sometimes it's more convenient to work with the gradient of Green's function. Uh, so it's also uh, yeah, equal to gradients of Green's function times, times delta, yeah, times the distance to the boundary. Yeah. Okay, so let's 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 have a ten-minute break. Uh, okay, uh, the second part: discrete complex analysis. Uh, so many many of the problems we'll work on they are better formulated in the discrete, uh, and um, also, I mean, if you talk to physicists, many things uh, are easier to formulate in the discrete setting. And uh, um, for example. It's the easiest way to define a field theory is to define some discrete object on a lattice and then pass to a limit. And if you look, for example, there is this famous list of seven one million dollar problems. There is problem about young mills and the mass gap. And uh, uh, the only mathematical formulation I know is if to find to find a, a theory on a lattice which satisfies certain inequality. I can't rigorously formulate it about some continuous object. Uh, and then this, this being not, not two dimensional but three plus one dimensional, there are no theorems which guarantee that there is a, that there is a continuous theorem. So we will we'll talk about the discrete complex analysis. So it's sort of a mini chapter. So it's uh, so discrete uh, harmonic and analytic functions. Now, uh, discrete harmonic functions are really uh, sort of a very widely known object. So if you have a graph, so if you have a graph, uh, any graph, uh, graph G, uh, so you define as a, the graph Laplacian, uh, let's say uh, uh, delta G of 
function uh, h at some vertex z. So usually people just write it's the sum of uh, u adjacent to z, h of u minus h of z. So it's point z. You take all the u's which are neighbors of it and you sum over them. Sometimes you divide, uh, some people do divide by the degree. Sometimes people divide by the degree of z, sometimes people don't divide by degree of z. So this is, this is quite common and uh, it's also uh, related to uh, sort of related uh, to a simple random walk on the graph G. Uh, because basically it's sort of uh, from Z you go to one of the neighbors with equal probability and we'll see later how it's, it's related. So this is, this is a, a very, very common subject. People study it on many graphs. Uh, we, we, we have a seminar on Tuesday and sometimes on Thursday where they often discuss this on Kelly graphs of groups. Uh, and there are many actually open questions about it, strangely enough, still. So if you have arbitrary group um, or arbitrary graph. Uh, uh, now, uh, we largely know fairly well what happens with it on the lattices in two dimensions and three dimensions. So I can't think of a sort of really, uh, really, really important open question. So do the same thing on, on a square lattice. So on, on a square lattice, let's say, uh, lattice L, mm. Laplacian H of Z, you take the uh, uh, sum of uh, U adjacent to Z, H of U minus H of Z. So let me just say, so this is a square lattice. So Z and there is U1, U2, U3, U4, four neighbors. Uh, now uh, what I want, uh, to do, uh, so if you speak about arbitrary graph, it's sort of clear that you should, you cannot do any better. But my lattice sometimes will be embedded in a plane. And sometimes I will take a sequence of lattices with very, very small mesh. Because we are talking about some physical process where something happens at the scale of lattice, at scale of molecules, so it's much smaller than the scale of the space. So I, I am talking about lattice with mesh, let's say, delta. So I divide by, well, I can just divide by u minus the absolute value. So it's the same as the sum of u to z, h u minus h of z, divided by delta squared. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, immediately I want to make a few remarks. So uh, why, why, why do we call it Laplacian? Well, we call it Laplacian because if you plug in uh, a smooth function, uh, you get back the Laplacian. So, uh, so the first remark is, uh, let's say plug in, plug in a function uh, h, which is c2 in some domain omega. So let's better do c4. So we just restrict it to the lattice. And lattice has mesh delta, which is very, very small. Uh, so what, uh, what do we get? Uh, we get that uh, delta, let, let me de denote, I, I want to somehow emphasize that it happens on the lattice. So let's let just me put the number delta because some people don't divide by delta squared. And we do divide by delta squared because we want to have something which is close to the usual Laplacian. So that's, that's the main reason. It's, it's like instead of, so this is like, looks like difference derivative, but to really get derivative, we should be divide by delta. But we are talking about second derivative, so we divide by delta squared. So, uh, so restrict to the lattice, uh, so what, uh, what happens on this picture uh, uh, we, we can write that uh, h of u1 is equal to h of z plus uh, delta derivative in the direction x h of z 
plus delta squared over 2 derivative second derivative plus delta cube over uh, 6 third derivative plus or capital of delta to the power 4. So this is just Taylor's expansion. So we went delta in this direction. Now if I go delta in the opposite direction, h u of 2, h of u2, then I get the same thing, but minus in front of the odd powers. And then I could do the same, uh, no, that was h u3. Now h of u2 will be the same, but with uh, uh, y derivative and h of u4 is the same, but with minus signs. So that must be clear enough, it's just uh, Taylor formula, Taylor expansion, so that's why I asked the function to be C4. Now uh, suppose that I write lattice Laplacian of the function h. So this is basically uh, sum of h of uj minus 4h of z divided by delta squared. So I have to sum all these guys, and when I start summing all these guys and I subtract 4hz, so first these two terms they cancel out because they are opposite signs. These two terms cancel out because they are opposite signs. These two terms cancel out, they are opposite signs, and these two cancel out. Now uh, h will cancel out this, this whole h's. So the only terms we get left are those and O capital. So it will be uh, delta squared plus delta squared. So it will be delta squared hxx of z plus delta squared hyy of z divided by delta squared plus O capital of delta to the power 4. So we get uh, Laplacian of h at point z. That's why I divided by delta squared in the first place plus or capital of delta squared. So we call this thing Laplacian because this thing is exactly the Laplacian up to small, small perturbation. O capital is uh, in terms of maximum of 4 degree 4 derivative and one should sort of note that it's delta squared not delta so it's slight over Q because of the symmetry. So I, uh, mm, uh, yeah, and we say, so it's basically uh, in particular, this also means that if H is harmonic, continuously harmonic, then uh, Laplacian of uh, Laplacian, uh, discrete Laplacian of H is O capital of delta squared. Now, uh, the remark I want to make, so that was the first remark. The second remark is that you can come up with many, many other Laplacians. So for example, on the same lattice, what I can do, I can, well, I did this thing, so I took, I took Laplacian which corresponds to random walk where you jump with probability one quarter to four neighbors. But what you can do, you can take a Laplacian where you jump across the diagonal. Or you can take, uh, it was quite hilarious, but uh, we really at one point we uh, arrived at a Laplacian which, which in a logical way, which did the following. It jumped, uh, how we would say, Leapfrog or Sot Muton or Chiharda in Rus, so uh, which jumped over one. So you, you, can, you can think of anything. So it's, uh, 
Yeah. Or you can you can do well some hybrid version. You can actually come up with a coefficient so that the, this will come up with this will work just uh, uh, with some coefficients. And uh, essentially, essentially uh, you can do you can do different graphs. So for example, if I have a graph which is a not square lattice but a rectangular lattice, I can do this Laplacian, but the conditions the coefficients should be different. So by the way, uh, exercise uh, figure out coefficients uh, here if, if the size uh, if the sizes are let's say what was the size is delta delta and here it's like a delta. So if if it's a to one relation, what should be the coefficients? You can do of course triangular lattice. Uh, or you can do, you can actually work with arbitrary graph. So uh, the bottom line here, I, I want to say basically two things. Uh, that uh, one thing is that why there are so many Laplacians because there is a sort of universality. If you arrive at a degree two operator, and if you take only a few points, then you can't get more than degree two. If you write degree two and it's rotationally invariant, it has to be Laplacian. So you don't have much choice. Uh, if you arrived at something important, it has to be Laplacian. Or, other, or you either arrive at Laplacian or you arrive at garbage. Of course, if you arrive at something nonlinear or you arrive at high degree operator, say, say degree four can be by Laplacian, but there, are, there is also more choice what you can get. So there are, um, if you have higher degrees, but to get higher degree uh, with such argument, you need not five points like we used, you need like 11 or whatever. Uh, so this is, there is this uh, sort of universality, so we can define many random walks. But all of them will converge to Brownian motion. Maybe skewed, maybe with drift, but basically, uh, so uh, essentially, if you go to random walk, there will be five properties when you pass to a limit of random walk. Uh, and the five properties will be it might have drift in one direction, drift in another direction. If by some accident I don't get here the same coefficients one and one, but get coefficient one here and two here, then I will be twice more likely move to the right. And also it can be skewed, so there will be three parameters which say how it's skewed. So it's basically xx derivative, yy derivative, and xy derivative. But essentially there is a universal, so whatever you arrive at, it will be Laplacian did a little, well, skewed a little bit. And uh, well, the second thing is because of that, it's, you can play whatever you wish. But then there is a sort of a set sad story is that uh, sometimes you play with one thing it works well and another doesn't. Because uh, as, we, as we see in 10 minutes, uh, some theorems from complex analysis are easy to transfer and some are difficult. And those which are difficult sometimes is easier to transfer than the others. For example, for this particular thing, symmetry tells us that you have a capital of delta squared. If I recall correctly, uh, well, certainly uh, there are some non-symmetric ones where you get just a capital of delta and then it's more difficult to work with it. Uh, also, uh, for a long time it was sort of a big question if you have a graph, uh, an arbitrary graph, how to embed it so that there is a nice Laplacian. So it looks like we figured it out last year or I, our colleagues, so uh, Chilkak, Kenyon and uh, Ruskik, they figured it out finally that there is a good definition uh, which works well. But uh, before we had to live always with some special graphs, like for example, the best we could do two years ago was the tiling by Rombay, which, which is still has some symmetry, but for example, doesn't have, oh no, Rombay still has that square property, yeah. Okay, but uh, so th there, is, there is this sort of thing that whatever I say from today, from now, today is non-canonical. It's not like there is a canonical discrete analysis which works well, uh, and that's the reason why there is no discrete complex analysis textbook. Because if you open a complex analysis textbook, there are like 60, 70 in the world, maybe 100. They all start the same. The first five chapters are the same. Uh, th then you might have some have elliptic functions, some have conformal maps. There are many, uh, many extended chapters, but the beginning is always the same. So here there are two things uh, which are the same. So properties, easy properties. is that if h and g 
a harmonic. Let me just write harmonic delta to emphasize that we live on a lattice with a step delta. Then alpha h plus beta g is also harmonic. So linear combination is harmonic. So that's, that's easier. And then the second property is that uh, maximum principle holds. So uh, H inside omega is at most maximum of H on the boundary of omega and is at least minimum of H. And this is basically because uh, what does it mean that discrete Laplacian is zero? It means that you have a mean value property just at one step. So function at every point is the mean, mean value of its bar. It's, uh, neighbors. So this is because, uh, because uh, delta h is equal to 0 implies that h of z is the mean of its neighbors. So if it's mean of neighbors, it cannot have maximum or minimum inside. Because if it's a maximum, then it's mean of the neighbors. They all are equal to this maximum. And their neighbors are equal. And then everywhere it's a plateau. So you have a constant function. And also another remark is that uh, uh, this thing, uh, so this inequality about maximum, it works for uh, subharmonic functions. So works uh, for subharmonic. Subharmonic are functions where Laplacian is positive. And this inequality works for superharmonic, where Laplacian is negative. Because if Laplacian is positive, then the function can't have maximum inside. Because Laplacian being positive means that uh, uh, h of z is at most mean of its neighbors. So it's, it's just there that it's, uh, it's here. Oops. It's, it's at most for subharmonic and at least for superharmonic. Well, that, that's, that's basically it. Those are the easy properties. Now, uh, the question is uh, how uh, uh, to, uh, to proceed. And first, I want to maybe introduce discrete holomorphic functions. So let's say discrete holomorphic because they also have some easy properties. And with discrete holomorphic, yeah, why I call them discrete holomorphic, not discrete analytic? Uh, because uh, analytic function is a function which has a local power series expansion. Power series expansion doesn't make sense on a lattice. So proper definition is holomorphic function, which, which, which has a primitive and all that. So discrete holomorphic. Uh, uh, now, um, what I will do, I will do something which uh, Mm. So uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll take a lattice which is rotated by uh, 90 degrees. So this by, oh, sorry, 45 degrees. So I'll take a lattice which goes like that. It will, it will be clear in seven minutes time why I rotated by 45 degrees. Well, first I rotated by 45 degrees to, to denote the vertices east, west, north and south. Uh, and denote the center of this by z. So discrete holomorphic on, on the square lattice, on square lattice L. So first, I want to divide discrete d bar. So d bar f, uh, d bar delta f, 
это point z is equal to uh, and uh, let, let, let me just recall uh, so reminder reminder uh, what was the d bar uh, in the usual case it was dx plus i dy over 2 so I want to do dx and dx I can do by taking a horizontal difference so I take uh, f of east minus f of west and I divide by twice east minus west and I add f of north minus f of south and I divide by uh, uh, twice uh, north minus south yeah maybe you know maybe yeah maybe it's better to stick with this definition then dx is this thing dy is this thing with absolute values and I have to put plus i and then I can rewrite it as f of east minus f of west divided by twice east minus west because east, and east minus west is a real number but north minus south will be an imaginary number so it will be minus f of north minus f of south divided by twice north minus south yeah, so, that's, uh, so I, I here use, use that uh, north minus south is equal to i times east minus west so we use that north minus south is i times east minus west Uh, let's let's denote uh, suppose we assume uh, that delta is the length of the diagonal so for some weird reason I prefer to fix not the step of the lattice but rather the diagonal like the square root of 2 times the step of the lattice and I'm sure that I, I will uh, confuse myself in in the next lecture and forget, forget about square root of 2 uh, now um, well exercise exercise suppose that f is a c3 function then the discrete d bar of f is equal to the usual d bar of f plus or capital of delta cube uh, no delta squared if f is holomorphic then d bar of f is o capital of delta squared now I uh, sort of must say that harmonic functions are really quite ubiquitous in the graph theory so you, if, if you google graph harmonic functions on graphs on lattices you will find like uh, thousands of papers probably now uh, and they, they also work very well in R3 you can do the same thing in three dimensional lattice no problem uh, or any graph now for analytic functions you have to be in the plane and before they start being applied in some probabilistic model essentially there were like three series of papers by three different groups of people which discussed them so there were French people in 40s in Paris some Americans in 50s in Texas uh, and uh, there were some Russians in 90s uh, in Moscow now uh, the reason is that uh, there are many nice properties but uh, only half of the nice properties of the usual analytic functions so the definition we say that uh, we say that function f is discrete holomorphic or discrete analytic holomorphic is a better word we say uh, we say that f 
is discrete holomorphic if uh, the discrete d-bar is equal to zero. So that's all on the right, is discrete d-bar of f is equal to zero. So in domain omega delta, if discrete in domain omega delta. So it's some, some discrete domain, meaning a piece of a lattice. Which means, if you unwind this definition, if you look at this definition, it means that uh, f of east minus f of west over east minus west is equal to f of north minus f of south over north minus south. So it's exactly that difference, difference uh, horizontal, derivative horizontal is equal to derivative derivative vertical. So function has a complex derivative. The same thing is as in the usual functions. It doesn't matter in which direction you differentiate. Now, uh, mm, properties. Uh, so, uh, should we take the same numeration as with harmonic functions? Well, let's, let's do the same numeration. So, it's property 3. So, f, g, a discrete holomorphic means that alpha f plus beta g, discrete holomorphic. Now, functions 1, z, and z squared restricted to a lattice, they are discrete holomorphic. I will leave it as an exercise, another exercise check. The fact that function uh, identical 1 is discrete holomorphic is quite easier. z and z squared requires a tedious calculation of uh, half a line long. Now, uh, there is a property 4. Uh, which is uh, the worst property that, uh, in general, f times g or f composed with g is not holomorphic. And that's very, very bad because much of the complex analysis is built uh, over the fact that our functions, they, they, they form a ring or even you can divide them if they are non-zero. Uh, and if you look at like Cauchy formula or any other formula, you always multiply them. And here you can no longer multiply them. So I leave it as an exercise that it's in general not true. It's better to figure out. And uh, the reason why it's in general not true is, is very easy because uh, what, what's the formula for the derivative, uh, for the derivative of a product? Hint, it's the same as the usual derivative, prime derivative. So it's d bar f times g plus d uh, plus f times d bar g. Now, does it change if, uh, if, I put, if I put delta? No, it doesn't. But, but what happens, you have seen that d bar is defined not on this lattice, but on a different lattice. So what happens is that uh, when you do this thing, you have to jump to different lattice in, do, in two different places. You jump to different places, and it doesn't add up, so it doesn't work. So it, it, uh, it doesn't work because you have to jump to different lattice. And uh, so this, this formula in discrete, it's like that, but with the different derivatives here and here. And so it doesn't work. So, there is, so maybe uh, the easiest example is that, uh, for example, z cube doesn't, is no longer holomorphic. So, and z cube is a product of z and z squared. So that's, that's, that's a very, very, very bad news, which leads too many problems. Now, uh, I will, nevertheless, there are several nice, nice facts uh, which, which, which we have. And, uh, well, I had this reminder. Let me just do one more reminder. So it's a reminder that, uh, uh, so d is equal to dx minus i dy over 2. Uh, then uh, we define, uh, so for, uh, for f holomorphic, 
and the lattice L, we define define uh, df to be uh, to be the difference uh, f of east df of z is f of east minus f of west over east minus west, which is the same as f of north minus f of south or north minus south. And the really important remark is that uh, df is on dual lattice. It's defined on a dual lattice. So it's defined at the lattice of the uh, centers of these squares. So the properties are, so that's the property five, that f is holomorphic uh, in a domain on a lattice L, or oh, let's say omega, uh, well, let's say on holomorphic on a domain in a lattice L, let's say omega with index L, that implies that df is discrete holomorphic but on a dual lattice, on the same domain in a dual lattice. So you have to take, uh, so you start uh, with, the, with this lattice, but the derivative of f will be defined on a dual lattice. But the second derivative will be defined back on the same lattice. So it's not, not, not to despair. And property six, if f is holomorphic uh, on a lattice omega L, then uh, f on white vertices is harmonic. I will just say in a second what I mean. White. And f on black vertices is also harmonic on black vertices. Now, uh, what I mean uh, is on this picture, I cover these two vertices black, which on the blackboard is white, and white, which is on blackboard is greenish black. Yeah. So uh, it turns out, uh, so we have this theorem that analytic function has a real part and imaginary part, which uh, are both harmonic. So it turns out that if you have a discrete analytic function f, oops, if you have a discrete analytic function f on this lattice, it turns out that uh, it's logical to define its real part on half of its lattice and imaginary part on another half. So this is one half, and this, well, maybe I use another, this is another half. So it turns out that if you have the analyticity property, homomorphicity property, which says that difference like that is equal to difference like this, then from this property, you can deduce, uh, let me just, just say, say proof, look, the difference like that is equal to difference like this. Agreed? Now difference like that is equal to difference like this. It's, it's all the Cauchy-Riemann equations. Difference like that is equal to difference like this. And difference like that is equal to difference like that. So what we get? That four differences emanating from one point are equal to the sum of four differences around the square. So the four differences semantic from one point, they sum up to zero. So the function is harmonic on these white vertices. So, uh, so this is uh, the trick. And um, because of that, if, 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 you look, if you look 
at the uh, Kasherian relation. So uh, if you look at the Kasherian relation we have written here that these two things are equal. Uh, so if you look at this relation f at e of east minus f of west divided by delta is equal to f of north minus f of south divided by i delta. So what does it relate? It relates a, a real part. So those are vertices which are black and those are vertices which are white. So it's relate real part of vertices here to a imaginary part here and vice versa. So with this definition, there is this rather weird property that I define the function, everything is okay, but it turns out that uh, my uh, condition, it relates real part on black to imaginary part on white and the other way around. So my function kind of splits into two parts. So if I just take real part on black and imaginary on white, it is analytic and everything is fine. If I just take this, it's analytic and everything is fine and a priori non-related. So a priori, my function, unless I put in boundary conditions, so I have some definition where it comes from somewhere, a priori this function f, it contains two discrete analytic functions. One is real and imaginary on black and white, and another the other way around. So some, some people who develop this theory, they call them two demi functions or whatever. Uh, so usually, usually, uh, people ask that f is real uh, on uh, black lattice and f is imaginary on white. Well, uh, that f is real on one of them and imaginary on another one. Okay. Now, uh, uh, should I should I prove these two properties or not? It's actually, uh, I sort of already proved the second one. So, uh, of course, the idea, I think, is that not that I prove it, uh, not that you do it at the exercise session, that you just check it at home, that you can do it, because uh, later we'll use some properties and it's, it's good to do some, some exercise. Uh, so it's, it's not a difficult exercise. So it's, uh, the first exercise is already, have, is already shown here. Uh, and uh, the second exercise, the uh, exercise number five, so this is, this is a picture of proof number six. So proof number six is pictured here. And proof number five, proof number five, again, I, I ask you to work it out. Uh, so, uh, what is proof number five? Proof number five is that I want to show that the function which is df, well, df is homomorphic. So, I need to take df uh, at these four vertices, uh, sum it with weights 1 minus 1 i minus i, uh, or other, uh, yeah and uh, get zero. Now, what is f here? F, uh, f here is, uh, well, for example, you can write it as a difference like that. f here, you can write as a difference like this, or like that, as you wish. f here is a difference like that, f here is a difference like that, and you should look at the appropriate constants, and it all will miraculously cancel out. So basically, I, I will let, let me just uh, uh, start doing this thing so that it's, uh, it's uh, more clear. So this, this, let these points be Z, U, uh, V, and W. And let the points in between be uh, A, B, C, and D. Then uh, F of Z is equal to uh, df of z is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. 
df uh, at point u is equal to f of c minus f of b divided by c minus b. df at point v is equal to something. df at point w is equal to something. So it's, well, d minus c, a minus d. And then you, you have to write what is the d of df. And d of df uh, is, uh, you just use this definition which I have written somewhere on the blackboard. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the definition for the, uh, well, sorry, d bar, d bar of df, the definition which is written here. Uh, so I, I have to write uh, uh, df uh, of uh, z minus df of v divided by z minus v. Uh, was there a one half? Yes. Min minus df of u minus df of w divided by twice u minus w. And then you just plug in these values and everything miraculously will cancel out. So it's you can also do it graphically, but I, I'm not sure, I don't know what is more reassuring, doing it graphically or doing, doing the formula and seeing that everything cancels out. If it doesn't cancel out, it means that you are better with arithmetic. So it's, uh, okay, and now what's the good place to stop? Mm, what's the good place to stop? Okay, I will do one, there is one more easy property and then I stop and that will be exactly Three o'clock sharp. So that's the property uh, number seven. So suppose that function H black is harmonic on in some domain omega black with no holes. Domain is with no holes. Then uh, there exists uh, unique up to plus minus constant. H white, which is harmonic on omega, uh, well, one is on black, one on white, uh, such that F, which is equal to H black on omega black and h white on omega white is uh, holomorphic on omega. So it's all discrete holomorphic. So if I take some harmonic function on white vertices, then I can find a harmonic conjugate. Again, the answer is, is this, this picture. And the uh, part Number eight, which relates to it, is that uh, if f is holomorphic in a domain omega with no holes, then there exists unique up to constant primitive function g. such that uh, 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 g on holomorphic on omega du domain, so that d g is equal to f. And the last property is that, uh, which plays the role in the previous one, that uh, if f is holomorphic uh, inside contour gamma, then the contour integral, or rather the contour sum, let me just denote it like that, or gamma f of z dz is equal to zero. So what I mean by a, by a contour sum over some contour so suppose uh, 
we take a contour which goes uh, well, which goes like that, for example. So I want to sum f over, over this contour, so I sum this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, this, 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 and this, and I sometimes dz. So here, when I go here, dz is equal to minus 1. When I go here, dz is equal to minus i. Here, dz is equal to i. Well, or rather minus 1 times uh, lattice step. So maybe minus delta, i delta, minus i delta, and here dz is equal to delta. So it's basically like contrainter, but you just sum with respect to the things. Now, uh, look, it's a good place to stop. Those are all the easy properties, and because we can multiply, there are no other easy properties. Now, uh, the last properties from 5 to 9, they all basically center around this picture. So for example, this last property, it just entails taking uh, that such difference is equal to such difference and then summing it up over the area and everything inside cancels out and only boundary remains. So I postpone, I think, all of that. Uh, the best thing if, if you try all of that at home. It's not, not difficult uh, compared to the other things we are going to do in the course. And it kind of makes you familiar with the discrete harmonic functions. And then Dima does it, does it at, at, at the exercise section. Now, uh, I had more ambitious plans for today. So I planned today uh, to show that uh, uh, discrete Dirichlet problem has a solution. That's easier. And show that it converges to a, a solution of continuous Dirichlet problem, which is not easy. It's a, paper of Kurund, Friedrichs, and Levy, three famous mathematicians, which was uh, so influential that it was like IBM even translated it as an internal report into English uh, from German, so that engineers could read it. Now, that's already a difficult problem because you need some estimates like Karnak inequality and discrete setting, we don't have them. So what uh, I think we will do, which actually makes some sense, is that once we start discussing discrete random work and some estimates, we will do that. So we now pass, uh, we'll have three, four lectures on uh, random walk, brown and motion. And then when we first need estimates of random walk, we'll, 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 we'll do that. Something like this. Okay. Questions? No? Okay.